Authoritarian Sociopathy, Toward a Renegade Psychological Experiment. Chapter 5, Ron Paul and the Lucifer Effect. The Lucifer Effect by Philip Zimbardo goes beyond his analysis of the Stanford Prison Experiment. It includes an in-depth study of mankind's capacity for evil, including numerous similar studies on obedience and the corrupting influence of authority. It ends with the atrocities committed by U.S. soldiers at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. But, as I was reading, I kept thinking about Ron Paul and the ongoing controversy in the freedom movement as to whether supporting political candidates or taking direct action is the better strategy. Obviously, Ron Paul is no longer involved in politics, but even though I supported him at the time, in hindsight, I'm glad he did not win. And even if Ron Paul is not the candidate who best represents your preferences, the question remains whether or not any candidate can ever avoid being corrupted by being given authority. At first, I was skeptical of Zimbardo's analysis because he was serving as an expert witness for a team of defense lawyers representing Abu Ghraib prison guard Staff Sergeant Ivan Chip Frederick at his court-martial. But his thesis is redeemed somewhat by acknowledging that those obeying authority are still fully morally culpable for their actions. His intention was to show that systemic forces, what he calls situational power, can transform otherwise conscientious people into authoritarian sociopaths. In the last part of the book, he conducts a mock trial, prosecuting the entire command structure of the U.S. military, which made the inhumane treatment of prisoners at Abu Ghraib possible, even predictable. The line between collective guilt and individual guilt gets a little muddy, which makes interpreting it a little sticky, but incredibly valuable. Applied consistently, Zimbardo's conclusions about the corrupting influence of authority should apply as readily to the U.S. military as to any other coercive hierarchy, especially the president. In 2004, photographs of the torture and abuse taking place in Abu Ghraib hit the American media. Naked prisoners, stacked in human pyramids, forced to simulate oral sex on each other, and a hooded man balanced on a cardboard box with the electric wires attached to his fingers that has become the iconic image of the scandal. One guard sodomized a male prisoner with a flashlight, and another raped a female detainee. In many photographs, a soldier is smiling approvingly for the camera. The photos were kept by the soldiers as trophies. The world stood in shock and horror as the evils of Abu Ghraib came to light, and many cried, how did this happen? But Zimbardo already knew, because he had seen it before in his own experiment. As an expert witness, Zimbardo was granted full access to all investigative and background reports related to the case, and it was witnessing the cruelty at Abu Ghraib which convinced him it was time to publish the full results of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Zimbardo was dismayed by the instant refrain of military and governmental representatives that these soldiers were just a few bad apples. Zimbardo insists that their behavior was the result of systemic forces from an entire bad barrel. Abu Ghraib had been used by Saddam Hussein for public executions, and when it was taken over by the U.S. military, very little changed. The name was kept the same specifically because it elicited such fear for the Iraqi people. The most striking evidence he presents of systemic evil in the military ranks were the findings of the Schlesinger Report, which was an independent panel to review Department of Defense detention operations. The report includes documented discussions of high-ranking military personnel about the Stanford Prison Experiment itself, implying they didn't have to give orders to torture because the research indicated the situation itself would produce torture. The officers in charge of Abu Ghraib had no previous experience running a prison, just like in Stanford. The soldiers, charged with maltreating detainees, had no previous record of antisocial or inhumane behavior, unless you count enlisting, just like in Stanford. 
And even though they repeatedly asked their superiors for instructions and standard operating procedures, they were given none and told only to maintain routine operations and to be creative, just like in Stanford. What's really disturbing about this is that scientific research that had been conducted to prevent abuse was instead used by those in power to orchestrate situations where they could have confidence torture would occur without explicit orders, providing them plausible deniability. So, why do I say this has ramifications for electoral politics? I've come a long way for a pretty incredulous punchline. But here it is. Let me start by saying I love Ron Paul like family. No, seriously, if he needed bone marrow and I was the only match, I would give it to him. My conundrum has been that even though I have philosophically accepted that the electoral process is corrupt, when Ron Paul ran for office, I still thought about voting for him. If it were a simple race between the Republican warmonger and the Democrat warmonger, not voting would be easy. But when principled peace candidates step in the ring, it challenges my integrity. What Zimbardo has shown is that all of us, given the right circumstances, are capable of monstrous acts. So, why would I want to put a loved one in those circumstances? People sometimes call America the Great Experiment. But, in reality, it's just another prison experiment. The only difference is we elect our prison guards. If Zimbardo's thesis is correct, it doesn't matter whether the prison guards are elected, appointed, or selected at random. We often mistakenly think that evil people are attracted to power, but that's not what the research suggests. The studies show that power turns otherwise virtuous people evil. Even Zimbardo, a psychology professor whose life work has been opposing evil, was taken in by it when the systemic forces called for it. Viewed through this lens, it's entirely possible the ambitious promises of presidential candidates are made in earnest, but their priorities are changed by the office they hold. And I see no indication that this would not happen to Ron Paul or any other candidate. Even Paul played the earmark game with spending bills in Congress. That's not a condemnation of Paul. It's a condemnation of the office. It's a condemnation of power. In the end, I realized that I can only support a political candidate if I dehumanize them and think of them as a fictional character in a crappy game show. If I met Ron Paul face-to-face, heart-to-heart, as equal human beings— I would advise him to return to medicine or seek some other productive work. I'd like to see Ron Paul publish a tell-all book cataloging all the dirt he saw in office but was too much of a statesman to expose at the time. Anything but taking power over others. Because I don't want a good man to run the prison. I want to abolish the prison system.